I'm so glad to be here and to see you all. And I praise the Lord for this great privilege, the privilege of being here with his people. And, you know, one psalm that was uh, going through my mind as we were singing together, worshiping the Lord, is the Psalm 113, which probably many of you have read it over and over and probably know it by heart too. It says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servant. And I know that we, I am in front of God's ser servants. And that's why we gather here every time to come to acknowledge his power and who he is. And then he continues to say, praise the name of the Lord. The name that has been given unto the world by which they can be saved. He said, let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. And it goes on to say, who is like the Lord our God? The one who sits enthroned on high. This is the Lord we are serving. We just sang that He is the miracle maker, promise keeper. I don't know about you. For me, I consider myself as a miracle. Because every day we're living is a gift from the Lord. And coming from the setting that I am from Haiti. I could spend all day telling you what's going on, but I really don't feel very comfortable as coming here to complain because I know complaining is something that God does not really want us to do. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why the children of Israel had a hard time getting to the promised land. But however, realizing that we are all here to worship him and also to bring our worries, our burdens to him, he's able to do far more than we can imagine or think. I like that verse that I see in your bulletin. That's one of my favorite that has been that way for many years. I praise the Lord for the privilege of knowing at least this. So I want to start by thanking all of you for the blessing of having been asked to come here and share with you at this time. And I want to thank you especially for your prayers. I know there are many of you who pray for us, and I want to thank you also for welcoming my son and his family in your midst here. And I have really been blessed by the growth that I see in that family. And I know that you've been part of it by your support. And I would say by your, your examples too. And the Lord has the glory. And I know you're doing it with all your heart. And I'd like to continue to pray that God will give you the wisdom, the courage to be able to continue to do that for each other because we need one another Haiti is not that far away from this I would say place of abundance that's what I call the United States of America when I come here I always I always got hit by this uh, wealth that you have here you probably don't think about it but some of you who had the privilege to visit Haiti and probably other third world countries, you, you will agree with me that you don't know what you have. Until you have left this country and 
seeing how it is going on the other part of the world, you will never understand the blessing that the Lord has entrust to, in, entrusted unto you. So, I have sometimes a hard time realizing that we can be in a, this close and then we can be this bad off, if you allow me to put it this way. But you know, that is my human way of looking at things. But we know that in God's eyes, what sometimes we think is blessing sometimes is not really exactly what God sees. Everything that God makes is a blessing for us because he doesn't need them. But are we thankful enough? Are we grateful? Even the air that we are breathing should cause us to know how important and how great God is to us. A few years ago, there's an old man that used to come to our place very often begging. He was blind. He was led by a, a little girl. I think that was his daughter. And uh, I remember one day he, I got a call, and then uh, on the other line was the little girl. And he sa she said, my dad is in the hospital, and uh, he cannot breathe, and they order that he has oxygen. And uh, we don't have the money. And I said, well, is the doctor nearby? Can I talk to him? She said, yes. And I said, please ask him if he would allow me to talk to him. He said he would not take the phone. Probably has had that before. Probably no, thinking that somebody is going to talk him into giving the oxygen free. And uh, probably they have not paid him in the past. So when she said he, he would not take the phone, I said, okay, I'm coming right away. So I did all I could and I bid it down there and then had enough money to pay that they would administer the oxygen to him. But you know, I had to think about it. I said, how often do I thank God for the air that I am breathing every day? Have you ever taken a time, have you ever thought about that? The air that you are breathing freely? Even thanking God for the organ that you have been given that allows you to breathe. We need to think of those things. So I'm just taking this as something that probably most of us don't stop to think about to have a grateful attitude all the time, even just for this part. Today, we're here together to worship the Lord and thanking Him for many other things, but sometimes I think we fail to remember that we have also been given the duty or the, this homework to do, to care for each other. Coming from Haiti and uh, thinking of what is going on right now in my country, I would say it sometimes tends to, to become a distraction. In fact, and that's one area that I'd want to ask you to pray me, to pray for me. Because sometimes I find myself being so consumed by the news, by what's happening there, that I lose my connection. You know how important it is when you have a connection that is important for you. Take, for instance, your phone system. If you know your connection is not stable, you know it, it disturbs you a little bit because there are so many things that depend on that. I don't know about you, my connection with God surpasses that and is such so much more important 
And then and yet I find myself sometimes being distracted this way because of those bad news. That Haiti that is in the shape where it is right now, you probably hear it on the news, or maybe some of you don't even think about it, but it is a reality that I, I really don't have the right words to, ex to explain. Besides poverty, there are a few words I think I could use to summarize the actual situation that the country is undergoing. They are words like insanity, complexity, perplexity. Why is it this way? Who is behind all this? Who is this situation profiting? You know, I had to think a lot sometimes in this way. And there is a verse in the book of Proverbs, chapter 14, verse 34. It says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people. I'm quoting from the NIV. It probably reads differently in some of the, the others. And from my language, it states that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a shame for all people. And we know that all that the world is undergoing that is, that's, that, that is bad is the result of sin. Because God did not intend us his likeness, or let me put it the, on the other way, because saying it like, likeness is probably too, too, too high. But as his image, he did not intend for us to be this way. But however, I'm sure that you know it. Most of us here know that it's because of sin and because of the enemy. And you know, all that leads to depravity. And you know, depravity leads to death. As Paul quotes it so clearly in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The wages of sin, the wages of sin is death. But there is a but. And that is where you and I, we can have a grip on knowing that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Godlessness, insensitivity, Lawlessness, wickedness is equal chaos. The expansion of gang activity around Port-au-Prince and other parts of the country plunged Haiti into an unprecedented chaos. By all accounts, these gangs vying, vying for power desiring power so much constitute a source of terror, widespread violence, insecurity, and development, developmental hindrances. Thousands of people have been forced to flee their homes in order to save their lives. This is a real humanitarian crisis that is gradually destroying hope and development and prosperity in our country. We need your prayer. Prayer that God would restore hope into our people. Thousands of Haitians have left the country in the hope of finding a place to pursue their future, their dreams. 
It is a very risky endeavor for many of them. And you know, probably you have talked to some of them. Some of them has, have risked the danger of traveling on foot for months to reach the shore of the United States to try to come to a place where at least they could feel safe. there is now an ongoing drainage of qualified workers and professionals towards they all live for neighboring countries like uh, Dominican Republic uh, other countries in South, South America but mainly the United States of America the situation is weakening the established situations, institutions, excuse me, like schools, churches, hospitals, business, and as well as slowing down the developmental efforts. And across our border, you know, Haiti shared the island with the Dominican Republic, which is in the eastern part of that island but there is an anti Haitian sentiment that have been I would say ruining the relationship of the two countries for years and lately it's it has worsened and uh, it seems that there is nowhere for the Haitians to turn and, and I know that there are other countries that are in the same situations too, like those places where there is war right now going on. Maybe there are people that just feel they don't know. I'm thinking now of the Jews, the Israelites, for instance. Maybe the Palestinians too. So problem is something that is, that is, un, that is going on all the time in many places. Big scale corruption and outgoing kidnapping crises have paralyzed the country. Many schools remain closed around the capital Port-au-Prince and other affected areas like the Artibonite, for instance, which is the central part of Haiti. Families remain fearful of venturing out, out of their homes. Food, transportation, gasoline, medicine, construction materials remain a big puzzle to solve. The situation affects the cost of living and worsens the vulnerability of the people throughout the whole country. It's like saying that Haiti appears to be in a death spiral right now under the current situation. So the big question again is to ask ourselves, is there hope? And I would say that there is hope. We have a saying in our <laughs> culture that anytime there is a head, but lit, that's the literal translation saying that there is hope. Anytime there is someone living, there is hope. Or we have another way of saying it, espoir fait vivre, meaning that hope breeds life. So we need hope. And we know that there is only one true hope and real hope. Jesus is the hope. Jesus is that hope, the hope of the world. When you have Jesus, these problems that may be there, but that's not going to be a hindrance for you to feel happy, to have, to experience peace. And that is one thing that I would take the time to ask you to continue to pray for us, that God would bring this hope First, 
That is the real need. But at the same time, we are undergoing all this problem. God provides ways. I myself experienced something that was so shocking. One day I received a call and then uh, the person told me that, Pastor, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know where I live, you know how my place looks like. I have 14 people that are on the way to come to my place. And I tell you, the place where that family lives, it's just a two-room, little room that probably I would uh, estimate it to be 18 by 20 in size. There were already four of them in that. Now 17 people were forced out of their homes and they were on the way to come there because they're relatives. And we, in our culture, we will do anything to accommodate a family member in, situ in, in, uh, in trouble. So that's one. And I know of another family where they barely had a place to stay. It's, I, don't want if, I don't know if I would call it a place. Right now they do have a little place because the Lord has provided and some place was built for them. But still not enough to receive the amount of people that right now they're hosting. 20. Because people have been coming. Our school this year almost doubled in size because of people fleeing the country and then they come to the province. Usually the problem is right in the capital in Port-au-Prince. But out in the country you would know, if you would be in the country, you would know that there is trouble in the country. I mean, if you would be outside of the capital, in our area, particularly in the south. So our school went, almost went double. And you know what, that ha what happens when you have situation like gas shortage, and whenever you can find it too, it's so high that there's not much you can do. And then what makes it so difficult for our people is like the gangs they have established or they have set a uh, toll on the roads. Leaving the capital, you know, depending on what you are carrying, they charge you whatever they please. So what, that, what happens that affect everybody else on the receiving end? So I always say to people, you know, it is not our fault, but it is our problem. Because they bring the merchandise. I have, there is one person that I know, particularly she's a, a big marchand, we call them, a seller. Uh, she said she has to pay sometimes the equivalence of 2,000 US dollars for her truck to bring her merchandise. But you know, the person is, that is a business, he has to make a profit in order to continue. So who is going to pay? The poorest. Because the consumers, usually the poorest, we are, the poor people are the best consumers because they need, they have to have what they don't have. So that is the ongoing situation. But you know what? In the midst of all this trouble, we discovered there are opportunities. And that is another area where I want to ask you, please, to continue to pray for us and pray that the Lord will give us the wisdom, will give us the discernment so that we can take advantage of these opportunities. Just like Paul said, we need to be ready to share in every occasion, every, in every season. So those opportunities... I have just thrown together some pictures, like for instance, the one you're looking in the back here. We, are, we have been doing some stuff with the help that God allows us to receive sometimes from organizations, 
Christian Aid Ministries is one of them too sometimes that supports some of these uh, endeavors. So what you're seeing here is uh, some work that we organize out in the country because the thing is people have been coming and feeling bad for us over the years just giving things free to people. And that has uh, somehow uh, created uh, a, a mentality or a mindset of dependency in our people. And that is not good. That, that slows progress in people. So we don't want to continue that. So we figured that if we could provide something that would help people not only to earn what they need, that earn the money they can buy what they need, that's better for their dignity. And we help them better. For instance, you take food, you just pass on to people. And you know what happened. When it is given, people don't feel like, you know, it's something they need to be very careful with. You know, they'll, they'll steal it. And we, we experience that even with the food we used to receive from uh, organizations that donate food for the schools. You know, they will rob the truck sometimes because they think it's given. It's something that had been freely given. And on the other hand, if, you, if they know you have gone out to the marketplace and buy it, they will have a higher respect for it. So we figure that if we would just provide work, these people, not only they will work, and earn their money, but they will be able to use it as they need. So that's the reason why we have been involved in, in this. I, I'm not going to be able to have all the pictures I could share with you. Maybe someday I could we could probably set up a time where we could I could share with you some of the things that the Lord has uh, allowed us to do in order to help people move on. So this is a picture of uh, the school, especially this year. We needed a lot of help in order to keep those kids because many of them, you see they're sitting eating. Some of them testify that's the only food that they have for the day. That's why I, sometimes in the weekends they don't like it. Many of your kids here, they, they can't wait for the weekend so that they can go and play and things. But these guys, they know for some of them. Not all. Some of them know that if they don't come to school, they won't have any food. And this is true. Not too long ago, somebody called me to tell me that what someone that he knows that I know had told him that they have fled Port-au-Prince. And he said for three days, all he had done was to put a rock salt under his tongue in order to wait for the next day. He has not had anything to cook. So it is real. So we organize those uh, uh, activities in order to bring help, but the help that we know that will help them. For instance, for the kids, we know that helps them to be able to concentrate to learn in school. And those other pictures you just saw, them working on the side of the mountains, digging trenches, it's a way to help them to stop erosions for instance because the country it's not only the gangs that are giving us problems we have all kinds of problems that have been established over the past years because of mismanagement of the environment people cutting the trees like for instance you can imagine this is not too bad but there are places where we don't have big trees at all so in order to encourage them into taking care of the environment so these trenches, what they do, they, when, when it rains, you know, we have mountains there, and you know how water from the mountains can be very speedy and destructive. Instead of going and washing the topsoil down, which will render the, the soil uh, poor, or I would say uh, unproductive, so these trenches, they will stop the water, and then also force it down into the soil, and that would help the springs and also uh, provide water there, right there too, for the creatures there that need water instead of washing the 
topsoil going. And then we encourage them to plant, like you would see in another picture, these are uh, some grass, tall grass that the animals uh, use. You know, they use them to feed the animals. It's called Guatemala dra uh, grass. So, and also they will serve as protection to hold the soil too. So we have other things again that we do. Uh, and of course, the problem that we are undergoing, it just bring a lot of pressure. We, that's my best way of putting it, putting pressure on the food, or, or let's put it this way, on the local resources. For instance, you take a, an area, like one of the areas where we work, well, I would say that we estimated the within a 10 miles radius, we probably have uh, about 1,200 uh, families. But all of a sudden now, the population have doubled up. Now, when it's doubled like that, you can imagine, it, it causes a lot, it brings a lot of pressure onto whatever resource that people depend on, water, food, etc. And then the other thing is theft. I have a friend of mine that called me and said, well, I don't know what to do. This is so discouraging. I had seven banana hangers. Last night, the robbers came and stole every one of them. At least they, if, they would left, if they would have left one for me, I would have been so happy. I have another one that called me, oh, my, my yucca garden has been devastated last night. Somebody came around and pulled all the roots. So these are some of those things that, that those problems cause. So, sorry that I spend this much time telling, you know, I hope it's not coming across as a whining or complaining, but I just, I just wanted to share with you the reality so that you can know how to better pray for us that God would provide yet, but we need stability. But you know, one thing that is very promising is that God has no limit. And that's the God this morning we were singing that has who you are, miracle worker, promise keeper. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He can do more than we can even imagine. And I came across a verse that I want to leave with you. It's in Nahum chapter 1, verse 3. It says that the Lord is slow to anger and he is great in power. He has his way in the whirlwind and in the storms and the clouds are the dust of his feet. I don't know about do, you, but for me, for what I know, for what our people are undergoing, that brings hope and telling me that I can continue to hang on because God has no limit. Even in the whirlwind, even in the storms, He will bring away. Maybe for you, you don't, you're not undergoing the same situation that we're going in Haiti, but you may have a... Some situations, whether in your families or in your neighborhood, or something in life that seems to be cloudy or that seems to be impossible, I'd like to tell you today, we're serving a God that has no limit, even in the whirlwind, even in the storms, He has His way. I hope that He is that free to move in you that you have established a connection that is so solid, you will see His blessing coming true in your life. He may not answer you as you would like to, but one thing we know for sure, God will answer. Because He says it. He gives us ears, that means that He can listen, He can hear And when I think of all the things that I see when I travel, and especially here in America, I'm wondering myself, is it really true that there can be such a difference 
But you know, let me tell you, even for you here, maybe, let me put it this way, maybe that might be able to encourage you, maybe empower you to hang more on the Lord. We don't owe anything, you know that? And we Haitians, we can tell you that, especially those who are undergoing the problems that we're going through right now. You know, I've heard uh, expressions like this, you know, I have worked all my life to build this place, and all of a sudden now, I am not able to live in it. Here is where I am. I'm living under the roof of somebody else. I, I am just like, uh, like you would say in your English language, I'm like a sucker. A sucker. You know, it is, it is something to think about. And I said, you know, this world is not our home. Then that is true. You know what Jesus had to say one time to the disciples and those that were listening? I think in Luke chapter 9 you will find this. Right after he has fed the 5,000. And then... Maybe this is my own way of interpreting what happened, what took place that time. Maybe Jesus realized, and, you, and if you read in John chapter 6, you will see what happened. They were, trying, they were trying hard to see if they could make him an earthly king. And then he refused. Because what Jesus did was so impressive, I think. Because they they. they Imagine at that time, they were under the oppression of the Roman uh, rule. Just like right now, we are under the oppression of the gangs in Haiti. And then they were expecting somebody to come here that can deliver them. But not only that, they saw him taking five loaves of bread and two fish and fed 5,000 people and plus 12 baskets full left over oh i think jesus know that would have become a distraction just like you and i today we have so many things that god do do for us that you know turns out to be a distraction and one of them i can tell you is my phone it is a big distraction i find out many times i when i'm concentrating to 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 in my devotion all of a sudden my phone went bling and i said well i wonder who that is and then I lose my focus. It's a blessing. We can't deny it. But it's also a problem. It's a distraction. Now you can imagine these people thinking, well, hey, this guy can take five loaves of bread and two fish and feed that many people. I wonder if he would become our king now, how he would maybe kick the butts of those who are, who are bothering us. But you know, that was not Jesus' mission. And he had to remind them. You know what he told them? He said, What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? What good is it for someone to gain the whole world so that had, to, that had caused me to ask myself this question. Does anyone really own anything? I'm thinking about my country, for instance. I've built a house. We have a fairly large place because we used to receive a lot of people, sometimes coming, work teams and so forth. A six-bedroom house etc. But you know what? For over 20 some years I've been paying 18,000 good a year as tax. Property tax. You buy your land, you pay for your, with your own money. You build your house with your own money. And then now you are paying every year. After 40 years, you probably have paid it over and over again. So is it yours? You are a perpetual uh, renter. So it's not yours. That's, that's me 
thinking just so that I do not put my trust in those things because they're not mine. Yet we have the privilege, yes, I can say we have the privilege of taking care of them. Hey, man, I don't know what time is it. You, can, you, can you stand me for another hour? Sorry. I won't do that to you. But anyway, I just wanted to bring you to realize that you know, whatever the Lord has blessed you with is not yours. It can go like that. Like those people who have left their homes. Some of them, not only the gangs have taken over the ga the, their houses, they burned them. Because it's wickedness. We know that's the work of the devil because the Bible states it clearly that it only has three goals for humanity. Steal, kill, and destroy. And that's what exactly we are looking at in our country. Anyway, I like the way Paul commends those who have. And for you here, the Lord has blessed you with many things and I praise Him and I, I love to see it. In fact, I had such a wonderful time with your kids and I want to pray for them. I did start to pray for them. You have a generation of kids that has potential to become leaders. And you know what? We need better people in this world. And Paul states it so well in Philippians chapter 4, verse 5. He says that, Oh, uh, let your kindness be known unto all men. The Lord is near. I don't know how it states in your version, but that's direct translation of my, of my, trans, of my language. It says, let your goodness be known unto all men. The Lord is near. So this is a big necessity a big need for our world. And there is no one in a better place to make that happen better than you. There's no one better than you. Better place, in a better place than you and I to do that. Because we have the truth. We have life. The life. We have Jesus. Paul states this states it this way to those in talking to Timothy. He said to Timothy, Command those first Timothy chapter, let me just give you the reference. First Timothy chapter six, verse seventeen and eighteen. He said, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, not to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Isn't that what we are called to do? Yes, I think. God has called us to do, to share. We share in ways, many times people think that they have to give somebody some material things to really think that they're giving. Giving someone a, a very good hearing and listening to what they're going through. Giving your time. Taking the time to pray for somebody, for counseling somebody. It's all sharing that God has brought us here for, that he has saved us for. And finally, brothers and sisters, I would like to ask you to not only pray for us, but also pray for yourself. Pray for your country here that I see a declining. It's not the America that I knew 46 years ago when I first set foot here in the States, in Florida, which was pretty amazing to me. I remember when I got there, I said, where are the people? Because it was, I landed in Miami and I was driving home with the person that picked me up. And all you see is, was cars on the road. And you see houses, but there's nobody there. Because in Haiti, everywhere you go, there's a porch. Somebody would be outside. Or there would be people walking. It was very strange for me. 
But you know, there are things that I see happening right now, things that I'm hearing. That is not a good sign for prosperity, especially spiritual health. There are things that people are so bold about, things that God detests. I don't want to name them, but you know what I'm talking about. Right now, they're trying to take you back, backward, telling you that a kid will not know that he is male or female until he is an adult. He has to decide. That's crazy. It's almost like trying to say God didn't know what he's doing. And you imagine that they're pushing it on your school and it, it's coming my way too. You have a big job right now to watch over these kids. But I tell you that I had the privilege to be with night before last. I had fun with them except I couldn't sleep. But they were fun to be with. Full of life. And they had a listening ear when I was sharing with them. I encouraged them to think about God. I talk about obedience with them. Sharing and I hope in my, my, the way that I expressed myself, maybe it was clear enough. Encouraging them to be obedient as we know that obedience is a source of blessing. Starting with Obeying your parents. Well, I could go on and on. But I'd like to just stop here. Leaving you with these verses. Before I pray for you. In Philippians 4. Verses 4 to 9. I'll read these. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gladness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Let your gentleness, excuse me, <laughs> be evident to all. That's the verse that I have quoted a little bit ago. So this translation says gentleness. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the God of peace which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you do, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Our Heavenly Father, I want to thank you especially for this time. It's time that we can come together like this as a family in your presence to worship you, to learn, and to decide what to do with what you teach us. It's a privilege. Lord, we thank you for it. We thank you for this congregation, for the way you have helped them, Lord, to empower, to inspire other people. And I pray, Lord, that you will give them, Lord, the desire to continue doing what they've been doing for your sake. Protect them, Lord. Bless them. Give them direction. Keep them, Lord, in your will. Keep them, Lord, safely going the way that you have shown them. Wherever you call them, Lord, to serve, here at home particularly. And I pray for protection over the families, Lord, who are now facing all those attacks from the enemy to disturb them, to disturb their children. I pray that you would protect them, Lord. 
And I pray for this country particularly, Lord, that you will give directions to those who are in power. And I pray for your people that they will continuously bear your image and that your presence in their lives will be shown through their conversation, through their behavior, through their actions. We thank you and we pray in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. God bless you and thank you for your attention.